Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank TNS for hosting this event. Uh, most importantly, thank you for attending. Uh, just to go through really quickly the topics, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. So apologize, we're going to rush. It's gonna, we, I got 30 minutes to go through quite a bit of information. But we're going to talk about some of the trends that are currently affecting uh, some of the uh, security decisions that are being made today, I'm sure within your environments. Uh, we're going to talk about how Juniper really starts to think about security as it uh, is driven across your business. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to introduce, I mean, I think the, the coin of next generation firewall and next generation technologies are clearly used pretty loosely. But I'm going to uh, introduce, an, or maybe you've heard of these technologies already if you've attended some of the security trade shows, but I'm going to introduce some of the things that Juniper has recently launched that are really revolutionizing some of the concerns uh, as we're re-architecting our security posture uh, within the environments and how they're addressing those. Surprising. Um, virtualization really around 2005 really started to take off to the extent where it started to outpace the physical network environments that were being infrastructure, uh, in, kind of built in, uh, architected at that time frame. And the reason why, and the point that I wanted to make with this slide, because it is no surprise, is really what has evolved and what virtualization has meant in a security context. If we think about workloads being basically anywhere now, with cloud environments being deployed, uh, Basically, you want to be able to have the elasticity to drive your workloads and really not care where they reside, but be able to have fundamental access and be able to provide those resources to your customers freely without having the confines of security or architect ne network architecture uh, influencing how that occurs. So if you th also think of the evolution of compute and storage, that is also heavily influenced to the extent, and I'm sure you're facing some of these challenges, if it hasn't stressed your security posture, it possibly has even broken it. So how are we addressing, or what are some of the security companies like the Junipers of the world doing to start to think about pay, getting back on pace with what compute and storage has done and evolved to, and really bring the network back up to fundamentally being able to support the workloads, the compute, and the storage that's occurred today in its evolutions. So we went out and we did a study to try to figure out kind of what was really the next generation trends that are occurring. And it was pretty, it started to point out some pretty significant areas where Juniper has started to invest uh, to the extent of understanding that 73% of most of the attacks or most of the basically intrusion that is occurring um, basically through this poll to uh, folks like yourself is really occurring through the you know, targeted web application layer. It's coming from the outside in and that study also unveiled that over the last two years those 73 percent attacks have actually occurred and more alarming to that is that uh, Fifty-three percent of those attacks were really coming from the outside in, which really solutions built today are not really capable to address. And to me, the most telling part of this study that was done was that 60 percent of the folks that were polled like yourself said their current security posture wasn't meeting basically the demands and needs uh, that, they were ha that they have in place today. So those next generation solutions that we're coining for you guys are basically not really providing the security strengths around your data center that you uh, had basically uh, are, are wanting to actually be able to deliver. And out of those, we broke those kind of studies down and what were kind of the five key points that pulled from that study. And when I said that the outside in attack was the big vector that 92% of folks are being uh, really having to mitigate, it comes down to really that signature and IP reputation based technologies are really inadequate. 
and that web attacks basically um, that are uh, you know, continuing to occur, they're not really being solved with those existing tools. And if we think about some of the other types of evolutions around DDoS, that came up as something where at scale they're just simply not being stopped. So if you start thinking about what all of those attacks are coming from, they really are from the outside in. The bad guys coming, trying to gain access to your technology, to all of your infrastructure, your storage, your compute underneath the hood. And the last thing was is that the security postures that we have in place today, there's really no sharing between them. They don't communicate well. So if you've deployed basically a multi-vendor approach to your security solutions, they don't speak to each other. There's no open standards. And lastly, you know, there's ongoing confusion. And the reason why I brought up that virtualization slot, that, the trend, was there's really a ton of confusion around how do I actually secure a virtual environment? Especially as we evolve to private, hybrid, and public clouds, it's certainly starting to stress and break those types of security solutions, especially if we're still using old, archaic, physical types of topology to manage that security posture. So the last piece is quantifying that. We went out to Ponymon and said, tell us what it means for these, the, basically the cost to you around attacks that it would occur. And they broke it down into kind of those four quadrants, as you can see in the circles, around theft, reputation, and basically revenue. And I can share with you without naming the company, we actually had our first multi-billion dollar attack. So if you kind of back that out and think about that to your company, again, not saying that that would occur, but the risks that you run now are becoming more and more prevalent, especially around the revenue piece of that. You know, if you were to lose your network for 15, 20 days, if you were to basically lose customers, and more importantly, now be forced to figure out how to mitigate those problems through cap expenditure, what does that end up you know, costing you long term if you're not properly thinking about next generation, how to architect your security posture? So now kind of thinking about how Juniper is starting to approach the delivery of security across your business. I'm gonna break this into use cases, by the way, and also compartmentalize that into buckets in the way that we think about, and again, this wasn't something that Juniper just walked out and said, hey, this, these three things are what we're gonna do. We've actually done a lot of studies. We've asked our, our customers, our prospects, analysts, and we came up with these three basic uh, groups of how we start to think about security. And starting from left to right, we think about that in connectivity, whether it's wired or wireless, whether it's a user and a device, whether it's local and remote, whether it's corporate and personal. And we move into from basically, and again, if you think about connectivity, right, how are you enabling devices? I mean, and the pressure around your network is people want to use their own devices and more and more, and they, they are becoming more and more diverse. So how are you able to take a device from somebody who just wants to walk into your network and give them access, but in a secure way? And then of course we think of platforms, and we, that's more of the traditional data center, the core of the standard uh, fire, physical firewall topologies that you guys have today, virtual hosting clouds, how are we enabling you to be able to create the elasticity that virtualization brings to you and be able to, again, allow that to be through compute, storage, be able to be dispersed across your entire network, providing services, whether it's third party, whether it's providing services as a, a managed service environment, or whether it's providing services in your private cloud. Whatever that might be, how do you put a basically a use case or a, a posture around that that provides basically transparency but security with that. And lastly, we think about applications and content, whether they're legacy, whether they're cloud apps, whether they're local, uh, independent, whether they're applica you know, providing application visibility, and then of course, lastly, content protection around that. So I'm gonna start with the first use case, again, thinking of connectivity. And how does Juniper allow you, basically, 
And I would say this, let's say you have a specific user that is, is sitting at their home and is going to, um, in essence, has a home office and is looking for specific ac access into your data center. I'm going to go through product names and I will describe what they are so you don't get uh, acronym to death. So Junos, uh, Junos Pulse is basically a client that is installed on your mobile device. It allows you to connect, protect, and manage basically that device. And in this particular use case, this person is sitting at his home office and he's asking for access to the network. And the way that Juniper thinks about this and the solutions that we have wrapped around that is the ability for that client to access what we call our multi-access gateway, MAG, and some of you may be familiar with it. And what it allows you to do is two things. It allows you, in this particular use case, to gain a secure access tunnel. And more importantly, it creates a unified access. And specific to this, we're actually hooking into an active directory that says, I'm a user, I'm sitting at my home, I've got secure access, I've unified that to an active directory, and I'm able to take that now and mitigate that authentication at our physical firewall, which is our SRX series firewalls. So again, an acronym, when if I say SRX, that's a physical firewall. And in this case, because I'm sitting out at my house, I have authentication basically that allows me to have only access to all the human resource uh, information that would be available back um, on that human resource server. So again, the idea would be enablement, flexibility, the person can be sitting at their house, and I am also putting controls through access and unification of that access. I'm providing a secure channel for them. I'm able to set the policies at a physical firewall and be able to, again, direct exactly what access levels they have in their environment. The next use case is that same user, that same internal user, takes a shower, gets ready for work, and heads into your internal LAN. Well, we already know that basically he's an authenticated user. He already has a secure access, but he's moved. So through open standard 8021, we're able to identify that that, in, that user has basically now picked up his laptop or his mobile device or his phone and he's walked into your internal network. And by being able to do so, again, through understanding that basically the secure access, the unified access control in the Active Directory, we know who he is, but we also know now uh, that we've enabled basically identity that he's moved internally, so we can give him now additional access. So now he can have access to all of the financial information. So if you think about that from a connectivity standpoint, we've provided complete flexibility through our entire endpoint. Pulse client sitting on his phone, he walks in, he gets authenticated, and now he has basically access to defined uh, information that again you, you prescribe based on uh, very specific information and access points that he needs to, to, to be able to do his job. If I move to kind of the platforms piece of the conversation, this might be, again, SRX physical firewall. VGW is our virtual firewall. So this is where we start to talk about uh, the first steps of being able to take a workload, take a specific type of uh, physical environment where I might have set up within my topology um, physical zones, if you want to, if I can use that terminology. And what I want to be able to do is create micro perimeters and what Juniper has very adeptly been able to do is actually create integrations between our virtual and our physical firewalls. We've been able to do this for about two years and what it was able, it would allow us to start doing was some very interesting next generation things around solving the problem that I mentioned in those trends, which was how do we bring our physical and our virtual workloads into kind of a, a unified platform. So in this use case, I am basically um, a user asks, asking for specific access. 
And I have basically through substantiation of the SRX box and the workload through my virtual environment, I have been able to be bucketed into a specific zone, which would be that HR zone if we look at VM3. And I've been able to substantiate that policy through both the physical side of the fence as well as the micro perimeter capabilities of VGW and SRX combined together to be able to say through policy enforcement that I have access basically to VM3 and that VM3 is associated to the HR zone. So this is where, and, and kind of I didn't explain my background, but I come from basically VMware. So this to me was a big issue that even VMware through some of their products really had, had to try to start coming up with solutions to solve. And basically Juniper's VGW product um, as a best of breed, it sits in the kernel level driver. So it does some really interesting things. It actually associates in a virtual environment the firewall to the VNIC itself. So this is where we can do some extraordinarily flexible things with basically the substantiation between our physical and virtual world. Because now, because we are associating a VM to a, a VNIC, I'm getting a little technical, we can move, in essence what that means is we can move a VM, whether it's VM2 in this case, in this use case, or one, through a vMotion, if we were going to resource pool to provide additional resources to VM3, we can basically allow priority policies to navigate and move freely within your virtual workload and still maintain the security policy associated to it. So again, integration points, substantiation, flexibility, and the ability to allow workloads, compute, and storage to move freely and still be able to maintain your security posture around them. And again, this will allow you, as we go through next generation designs, this will allow you to optimize. No longer do you have to use, and I would assume some of you in this room might be doing so, using a private VLAN type of topology where you're coordinating off all of your VMs into one bucket, bringing them out into some kind of inspection device, whether it's a physical firewall or some type of an IDP, and then routing it back through the, the virtual switch. This will allow you to do all of your firewall management in the virtual environment itself. So how do we substantiate now the coordination between the perimeter high-end SRX firewall, VGW in the core, looking at that east-west traffic flow of VGW, but what it doesn't accomplish is what happens if I'm spinning up a private cloud and I want to run a true multi-segment environment where I'm spinning up resources for customer A and customer B. So Juniper's thought very deep about that and what we've actually created and is, is in beta right now under a controlled release is a virtual image of our SRX firewall. So now in the case, in this use case, if we look at this diagram, I know a little busy, but I'll explain it. If we think about still having a, a, the physical firewall sitting at the very perimeter of our data center and architecting traffic north-south coming through that firewall, but we're able to perimeterize that same firewall for a, a specific group of virtual machines as a core perimeter firewall, now I can guarantee complete segmentation between basically customer A and customer B within your virtual data center. More importantly, we talk about orchestration when we get into virtualization. So how do I conveniently or easily orchestrate the decommission, the, the bringing up of new resources for a specific customer? The virtual Junos V Firefly is what it's called. Is, is basically a piece of software. So vCloud Director, OpenStack, CloudStack, any of these orchestration tools that you may be considering as part of your delivery mechanism and orchestration platform, certainly you would want to have a way to be able to deploy very rapidly a complete perimeterized firewall 
with VGW sitting in the core between those two, basically, uh, the, the VMs that would be deployed to create a complete subset of perimeterized north-south traffic flow in your virtual data center and anything that's occurring east to west. So this one to me is probably the, 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 the area where most companies, whether they're a single player in security or they're a Juniper that has a vast majority of security products, has really addressed. And that's really thinking of the inside out problem. So this is still really starting to move into the application and content layer. But if you think about what this, is, what this means is basically I'm an internal user and I, you as the IT folks are trying to figure out basically when this person is pulling down something in, onto their desktop and uh, how do I substantiate that they're not affecting or bringing in some kind of a botnet ex or as an example into my data center. So in this use case you could think of I'm a user I'm pulling open a web application, Facebook. I want to allow Facebook, but I don't want this specific person to be able to play Farmville. So what does that mean with, as, as far as in our stack? So again, we can substantiate the, that through our physical firewall, SRX, by applying a policy associated to that. But we also wrap services around, which I haven't discussed, our, our physical firewalls at all. So if you think about, we can deliver application security. I don't think that that, in today's uh, kind of conversations, is anything unique to any of the security vendors. It's really providing visibility, and I, I would suggest that basically having visibility into the fact that one of your users is on Facebook playing Farmville is really not that exciting. It's really more what's happening to those back-end storage compute information. And as we start to go through the next generation conversations, that's really where the target and the vector of serious concern is starting to occur. So that kind of takes me into kind of that next generation solutions conversation. So we acquired this company called Mykonos. We've now renamed it to Web Apps Secure. And if we go back to the trends that I discussed where we reached out, and again, this was analysts that have done countless number of, of interviews with folks like yourself. We went through Ponymon, we've done some other uh, analysts that have, have done these studies as well. It's alarming to know how, mu how much, if you have any type of public facing websites, how much stress and how much attack vectors are occurring every day on those sites. So we went out and we thought about that and this really starts to revolutionize where Juniper starts to think about security. So if you think about that internal basically threat where a user downloads a botnet, how do you mitigate that? The question would be, and you don't have to answer this, but how would you mitigate a botnet attack utilizing some of the, the technologies that you would use today? And how would you do that in a way that wouldn't impact the services that you offer to your customers? And that's where the challenge when we talked about signature and IP reputation based technologies, that's where the real challenge of today's technologies are really facing. What Web App Secure does is something very unique in the next generation approach to that. We get compared to a web application firewall, but we're really not. We actually have the ability to do the same types of processes, which is detect an attack, profile an attack, track the attack, and deploy countermeasures against that attack. But we do something very interesting. We have a technology that allows us to go beyond signature and IP reputation based and actually deploy identity all the way down to the device itself. So imagine if you could block respond, track profile a specific user or a device and not only track them but know exactly where they're sitting. So if I was a tacker sitting in this, basically sitting right here in this uh, movie theater and I went out to an environment that had our Web App Secure product deployed on it, 
I literally can substantiate that it would tell the, the basically IT professionals that I'm sitting right here. So that is one of the big, huge advantages. So if you have any types of uh, issues around or are facing any of those uh, types of situations, I highly recommend that you contact Dwayne and we have conversations around this technology. It sits between your firewall and basically your web applications and allows us to do some very interesting stuff. It protects all of your critical web application uh, workloads, both in from internal and external attacks. More importantly, it's built to break automation attacks. So botnets, I, I'm using the, the example of a botnet. If a botnet is launched from the internal user uh, use case here, what it would basically do as it reached back out to gain access to your web application with the web app secure appliance sitting in direct line with it, it would basically detect that botnet and force a breakage. The idea behind Web App Secure is to change the economics of a, of a hacker or an attacker coming out to your website, but more importantly, be able to understand that device. So if it comes to the point of blocking, I no longer am blocking IP addresses, and if we all sitting here can agree, blocking an IP address could certainly pose significant issues around how you would be able to deliver services to your customers. There's examples of, company, of, of countries that have one IP address for all million of their, basically, community. So blocking one IP address blocks, the, and again, that's an example, but that is a fact. Imagine if you took that to a real use case, you may have a company with just a handful of IP addresses that would associate to their entire user community. If you block an IP address, you could potentially block good traffic. And that is the biggest concern around a web application firewall, is very few people ever run a web application firewall in block mode because of that reason. So the next thing we launched at RSA is we said, wow, we're, gra we're, gaining, we're gathering some fantastic information not just about an IP address or nothing that substantial, but we actually have this device. So we launched the first and only global attacker database that profiles attackers as they associate to their device. So why is that revolutionary? Imagine again getting a web-based attack we profile them, we detect them, we profile them as a bad actor, and we upload them into a cloud service attacker database. And over time, that database continues to grow. And what it allows us to do now, because if you think about kind of the evolution of attacks that are happening at your web applications, they really go in phases. And where this product plugs in is at the reconnaissance phase of your web application. So imagine if you could take now those profiles and substantiate and mitigate those problems as the attacker comes to the front end of your, basically, of that reconnaissance phase at your website, and you could basically substantiate a block mode to that device in your SRX box, which would be your physical firewall. That would be pretty fantastic, and that is the, the evolution that we see of this product very revolutionary, nobody in the industry is doing this, and nobody has a solution like Web App Secure that can take, truly take, with zero false positives, the, uh, the mitigation of application attacks, web application attacks, to a device. And the next piece that we're doing, and this is really at the kind of the beginning stages, we, we acquired a technology called WebScreen, and we're in the process of bringing basically the ability to solve DDoS attacks that would happen both at a large scale volumetric attack, but where this product really fits in again because we're talking about application and content, this really falls and fits into that area of being able to identify, identify slow and low attacks as they're occurring and looking to gain access to, again, to the back-end compute and storage information that you might have. Slow and low attacks are probably, volumetric attacks are easy to detect. There's a lot of technologies that do that very well. But slow and low attacks are extremely, are extremely difficult to detect. 
So with that said, we're going to kind of start wrapping this up. Pulling that all together, one of the things you know that we think about is if we take kind of a stacked approach of how Juniper thinks about delivering this across your business, we have a centralized management plane called Juno Space. Security director plugs into that. We talked about Pulse. We didn't talk about our threat response management system of being able to take correlation and bring that all together, but to me, that uh, I didn't have enough time for that. But the core of it is being able to have our physical pillar firewalls, our SRX series, our virtual, our cloud-based firewalls, and a set of services that feed between them. So I went through use cases today just to wrap this up. And I put together the components of an end-to-end -end security solution. By no way and no means does that mean that you have to buy all of those solutions to accomplish some parts of your security. They are all built as standalone products and they're all able to be integrated and pulled together and that's really, to me, the next generation of thoughts and what really kind of the why Juniper story. Kind of in summary, the evolution, and I've said this multiple times, the evolution of compute and storage, it, quite frankly, and I hear this a lot, has broken security postures. The security, the security technologies and the network is simply not kept up with those, that pace. We talked about the virtualization technologies. I can share, I, I probably could poll you guys. I doubt there's very many of you that have deployed some type of a virtualization technology from a security perspective. We talked about the signature and IP reputations. And lastly, if you're not using some type of a tiered security posture, if somebody's trying to sell you the bill of goods, that one solution solves your entire uh, security requirements, that's just quite frankly hogwash. It's not, that's not true. So appreciate your time and thank you very much.